The behaviorists are often thought of as the first truly scientific psychologists. This is because they focus their work on the only things that they could observe objectively. What you do to a creature, the stimulus, and what the creature does, the response. By focusing on testing these simple stimulus response mechanisms, behavior psychologists can conduct experiments on thousands of mostly animal participants, getting highly reliable results. The problem is the behaviorists had to make a massive sacrifice. They gave up on the idea of studying internal mental processes. You know, the actual thoughts that we have when deciding on an action. They simply thought the brain is a black box, not objectively observable, so not a scientific area of study. Let's see if that sacrifice was worth it. The PsychBoost app now has three features, flashcards, multiple choice quizzes, and see if you can work out the key term from its definition with the key term tester. Try paper one for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad free. Learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. The Behaviorist Approach, Defining Features. In this video, we'll explore the concepts of Pavlovian classical conditioning and Skinnerian operant conditioning. Behaviorists share a common understanding that the origin of behavior is through interaction with the environment and that psychology should be studied using scientific methods. Behaviorists believe that behavior is learned through experiences and interactions with the environment, in contrast to the idea that behavior is innate, meaning the result of genetic inheritance. To be considered a scientific discipline, behaviorists believe that psychology should focus only on objectively measurable behaviors. This led them to study stimulus response mechanisms, where a stimulus is applied to a subject and the resulting behavior is observed. The mind was considered a black box as mental processes are not directly observable and cannot be measured objectively. Behaviors claim that behaviors are the result of experiences and are therefore environmentally determined. They believe that behavior can be predicted based on the environment and controlled by manipulating it. Classical conditioning, Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov, a Russian scientist, originally studied the digestive system, but he made an interesting observation while feeding his dogs. The dogs would produce saliva before seeing or smelling food, suggesting they had formed a temporal association between the sound of his researchers walking down the hall with food and the food itself. From this observation, Pavlov developed the theory of classical conditioning, also known as learning by association. This is when an unconditioned response, such as drooling to food, is paired with a neutral stimulus, such as the sound of footsteps, or in his experimental research, a metronome. Over time, the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, producing the same conditioned response, such as drooling, to the sound of a metronome. To check you understand this process, and to help you in advance with the psychopathology unit, you might want to pause this video and think about how classical conditioning can be used to explain how someone develops a phobia of bees. At first, the bee is a neutral stimulus, causing no response. However, after being paired with the pain of being stung, an unconditioned stimulus, that automatically causes the unconditioned response of fear, an association is formed, and the bee becomes a conditioned stimulus, producing a conditioned response of fear. Operant Conditioning, B.F. Skinner Skinner is known for the development of operant conditioning. This is when a human or animal performs voluntary responses, meaning behaviors they decide to do and then learns from the consequences of these actions. Consequences that are rewarding reinforce a behavior and are repeated, and actions that result in consequences that are punishing are performed less. Skinner demonstrated operant conditioning with specially designed Skinner boxes. A hungry rat was placed into a cage of a bar and a dispenser. Eventually, as the rat explored the cage, it would press down on a lever which released a food pellet. The food pellet acts as a reward. The rat then learns that pulling on the lever leads to a positive consequence, reinforcing and making more common lever pulling behavior. What I've just explained is an example of positive reinforcement. A pleasant stimulus is added when the correct behavior is observed to increase behavior. Negative reinforcement is the removal of an unpleasant stimulus to increase a behavior. Skinner adapted his Skinner boxes to test negative reinforcement running an unpleasant electric shock to the wires under the cage. In this variation, pulling the lever temporarily turned off the shock. 
Again, this demonstrated reinforcement as lever pushing behavior became more frequent. Punishment is the reduction of behavior through consequence. Again, this can be positive or negative. Positive punishment is the addition of an unpleasant stimulus when the target behavior happens. Negative punishment is the removal of a pleasant stimulus. It might be helpful to think of positive and negative reinforcement and punishment in the context of a parent trying to change their child's behavior, either to keep their room tidy or to reduce their swearing. Again, pause the video and think about how these ideas would apply. So, to increase the tidying behavior, the parents would have to use reinforcement. An example of positive reinforcement would be giving praise to the child when they've tidied their room. Negative reinforcement would be the removal of an unpleasant stimulus. So, they no longer have to listen to their parents complaining about how messy their room is. To reduce behavior, punishment is needed. This can be positive, the addition of an unpleasant stimulus. So, when the child swears, they have to wash the dishes. Or the removal of a pleasant stimulus. Swearing means they get their mobile phone or Xbox taken off them for the rest of the day. This learning is reversible. If the consequences for the behavior stop, then the person or animal will stop performing the behavior, a process called extinction. It is possible to get animals to perform very complex behaviors through operant conditioning in a process called behavior shaping. Firstly, by rewarding simple behaviors and then rewarding more and more complex behaviors. What you can see here are pigeons that Skinner trained to play ping pong and groups of university students competing with rats that have been trained to play basketball with operant conditioning. Differences between classical and operant conditioning. As I've explained classical and operant conditioning, you might have thought they sound quite similar. After all, both forms of conditioning involve learning behavior from an interaction with the environment, but there are some significant differences. In classical conditioning, the response is involuntary. This means the unconditioned stimulus response mechanism is a reflex response. In Pavlov's research, the dog will naturally drool to food, and the association that develops between the neutral and unconditioned the stimulus is automatic. On the other hand, in operant conditioning, all of the rat's behaviors are voluntary. The rat decides what to do on the basis of its experience. Classical conditioning explains how response is acquired or gained, and operant conditioning explains how response is maintained. This is clear when applied to phobias, with a person gaining a phobia due to associating a phobic object with a stimuli that naturally causes a fear response, and when that person later avoids their phobia, their anxiety decreases, acting as a negative reinforcement. Evaluating the behaviorist approach. If you watched my Origin of Psychology video just before this, you know that behaviorist psychologists wanted to be as scientific as possible. Behaviorists research only what can be objectively observed and they systematically manipulate variables in highly controlled and large-scale studies. This allows behaviorists to demonstrate cause and effect relationships, and the highly standardized procedures used allows other researchers to exactly replicate Pavlov and Skinner's methods and findings. This focus on the scientific method raised the status of psychology, leading to its acceptance as a distinct scientific field. You've likely noticed that the behaviorist research by Pavlov and Skinner is conducted on animal participants. There are good reasons for this. You can fully control the environment of an animal and conduct experiments that, due to ethical reasons, you could never conduct with humans. However, generalization of these findings to human behavior is problematic. Humans are more intelligent, have complex social lives and cultural influences. This means the simple stimulus response mechanisms may not be an appropriate explanation of human behavior. Behaviorism has some important real life applications. These include effective counter-conditioning treatments, systematic desensitization, and flooding. Token economies and prisons, and mental health institutions that use behavior shaping to reduce aggression or prepare residents for life outside the institutions. Conditioning techniques have also been used for classroom management. The fact that these applications are effective not only help reduce maladaptive behavior, but also suggests the behaviorist principles they are based on are valid. While the applications of behaviorism have been useful, there are ethical concerns with using these ideas to control human behavior. It can be seen as manipulative, and some applications of conditioning ideas, like social media's use of likes to increase time spent on their apps so they can share more ads, and gambling companies' use of variable ratio reinforcement results in harmful compulsive behavior. We can criticize behaviorism as being overly reductionist. Behaviorists attempt to explain behavior as a result of simplistic stimulus-response links. 
many human behaviors like justice, culture, and self-sacrifice are either too complex or too difficult to explain as a result of reinforcement. Also, taking an environmentally reductionist position ignores a range of other explanations for behavior that there's evidence for, such as social learning, the unconscious mind, and the role of biology. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons, so if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course including questions on the Approaches unit. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video.